All right, so the test is tomorrow. Multiple choice, matching short IDs, and a diorama. So everyone bring a shoebox and clay. Just wait. We're going to do it again next year in another class. Okay. You named it. Happening. I'm not going to. It tastes. It tastes. Like it. I think it tastes like, you know, static from a TV screen. That's what it tastes like in my opinion. That's a very good analogy. I like that a lot. Standing on a TV screen, that's very cool. So I put nasty hints on the on teams. If you didn't bring your book, please bring your books, and you know who you are. I hope you feel shame. Please bring them in. Our books, and uh, I mean the two paperbacks aren't that expensive. The our regular textbook, you know, those are pricey. Remember that great term, oligopoly, a monopoly of just a few companies. That's about $150. Yeah. 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 The, uh, the textbook that the AP classes at Helm High use, um, I think I have a copy of that I used to. That's like $280. I don't think it's good. It's, it's actually it's a fine textbook. I just like this one better. Uh, oh, it is. Yeah. This is the free hundred eighty bucks or two hundred eighty bucks. Monopoly. That's my style. The book's fine. I'm, it's actually a good textbook. I just like this one better. Is this what we could? Do we get to um, impeachment? Monica Lewinsky, impeachment, yeah. And it's so weird that his approval rating actually went up. But I think a lot of it was people thought it was very unfair, even though still it was gross. And we oh. do something really quick. What books did you have? So it's just been a, okay, good. Okay, please bring them in. Uh, where was that? Oh, Monica Lewinsky. And, oh. What uh? What's the big trade agreement that was passed? And what happened? What happened to the difference between what do we call it when there's more imports than exports? What went up? Yes. Yeah, the trade deficit went up dramatically. What party was hammered by this? Democrats. Yeah, the Democrats were just hammered. And it's one of the weird ways that most people don't really, you know, because they have busy lives, they don't really follow the policy issues, but they know. It was just something changed. That was just this change. And who do you blame? The people in power. But of course, Clinton did, did support it. And who did Iraq invade in 1990 that would trigger the second Gulf War, the Persian Gulf War? Kuwait. And who did the United States leave in power after the invasion or the, the liberation of Kuwait? Who? Yes. Saddam Hussein. And trust me, the... Um, after this happened, the Bush administration, a lot of members of his cabinet and other, they call them, I'm not going to know the detail of this, they call them neoconservatives. I know the guy was neo stuff. They were really mad that, that Saddam Hussein was actually kind of mocking the United States after staying in power, even though there were horrible sanctions. Okay, so let's get to Clinton's legacy. So there was an economic boom in the 90s, but a lot of it was kind of a bubble economy, and there was the wealth gap continued to go up. There was a lot of deregulation. Remember, he was a neoliberal. And the biggest financial deregulation, Glass-Steagall, was uh, the Glass-Steagall, the New Deal banking regulation that gave a stable banking economy 
not say there weren't flaws, but stable banking economies, no bubbles was repealed in 2000 with the idea that this will trigger all kinds of economic growth. It would trigger something. In 2008, the worst financial crash since the Great Depression. No, they have not brought it back, which would have been a sound suggestion, but people make so much money when there's a bubble. And there should have been a sign this was going to happen. There was a, a bubble in tech stocks. All these new companies started because they thought the internet was going to have this unlimited uh, competition, which of course did not happen. And there would be uh, the tech bubble would crash. And so this is going to lead right into there's Clinton signing the ending glass eagle. So let's get to, oh, that's Bill Clinton. Did I show you this picture? Anybody know where that's at? It's right over there, just down, go down the hall, go up the stairs, go down the foyer, go into the gym. Yeah, Bill Clinton spoke twice here. Actually, he came three times to Montana, but twice he spoke at, at the gym here at the Capitol. Not to the student body, but they did it, they, they reserved it in the, for campaign. In 2008, he came after his wife lost the Democratic nomination to Barack Obama. He campaigned for Barack Obama. He came to Montana. And then 2016, before the Democratic primary in 2016, he came here to Montana. And so that's this. So I've seen him speak I don't know, four times, but this was the third and last time I shook Bill Clinton's hand. His head was the biggest thing I've ever seen. It's shrinking as he got older. His head was like a big pink watermelon. Moving on. Maybe I'll tell you the story about that. So. Couple things in really quick. 2000, the election of 2000, I put it up there for the election of 2000. Clinton's vice president, Al Gore, senator, former senator from Tennessee, he was kind of a, maybe not quite as neoliberal as Clinton, but fairly conservative, but he was tainted by the impeachment. He, he, he was scared to use Clinton's uh, booming economy, even though it was kind of a bubble con economy. And that really hurt him. The Republicans nominated George H. I'm sorry, George Walker Bush, George H. Walker, H. Walker Bush's son, who had a lot of problems as a young man, but would eventually become the governor of, of Texas. Of course, it did help with your father was vice president and president. But he uh, would run as he called it a compassionate conservative, and it's like it's just a slogan. The election was razor thin. And this was the first one I can remember where they started doing instantaneous tracking polls. And so like every day they had a poll of showing how close this election was. And for most of the election, it looked like Gore was gonna win a slight victory. And in the popular vote, Gore won a slight victory. But Florida was razor thin vote. And Fox News, which was about eight years old then, and Fox News is a, a you know, pretty partisan news outlet, but they called Florida for, for Bush. Bush declared victory, and then they turned back and said, no, we don't call it. What happened is television networks, they do exit polling. After you know, they, they get people when, they, um, when they're coming out of voting, they ask them, they take this poll, they put it in their polling models, and then they wait till the polls close. And sometimes it's so overwhelmingly they know who's going to win. They call the election, but they have the model. Then they compare that to when the numbers start coming in, when they start counting the votes. They compare the two. And so some states, it's going to be really clear. Like um, you know, New York and Pennsylvania, it was, or New York especially, it's clear it's going to go to, to go. Or for that matter, you know, Texas by then for sure was going to go to Bush. So they knew right away. Well, they made a judgment, and it turned out it wasn't quite true. And they called it back by that evening because none of the other networks, no other news organization called it. But Bush is going to claim victory and gave the feeling he won. And going into that night, it wasn't clear because the vote turned out to be shockingly close. Gore had 266 electoral votes, what was required, 270. Bush had 256, I'm sorry, um, 246, and then just 25 contestants from the poll. 
That's how close it was. Does this remind you of something? Remember the election of 1876? Three states and two sets of elect boards were either Tilden or Rutherford B. Hayes. That would turn out to be the compromise of 1877, where Democrats agreed to allow Hayes to be elected and then they abandoned Reconstruction. And Florida was one of those states. And this turned into a big controversy. The Gore campaign demanded a recount. As it turned out, the state was only about 100 votes uh, for, for Bush, but there's all kinds of election irregular, irregularities. There's really confusing ballots. In one county, the Workers' World Party got over 3,000 votes. Now, all of you are probably wondering, what the heck is the Workers' World Party? Nobody else knew. The way they had the ballot was set up, they had on two sides that kind of met, and they pushed a little punch spring. They had Gore and Workers' World, and looked at a lot of people just miss. So they had really confusing ballots. I mean, there's all kinds of screw-ups, and eventually would be a major crisis. So eventually, Florida would announce a recount. So here's a very clever little thing about that. Remember the Truman one of Dewey defeats Truman? He hold up that newspaper headline. That. And the thing that was so bad about this, um, to my point of view, is this whole red state, blue state thing came out of that. Because every day they would show this map. That's why I showed. That's why I used the green and purple. <laughs> So every day they said, as soon they started saying the blue states are voting for Gore. And that's where that came from, this election. Because every day for a month. Well, finally, it went to the Supreme Court. By the way, this is trying to recount to see who voted these old punch cards they use, this old system from the 1970s they're using. It went to the Supreme Court and Bush demanded the recount to be stopped and just certify the election where it was. And the Supreme Court in a five to four ruling a ruling that was so controversial that the, the ruling itself said this could never be used as a precedent for future cases. They ruled, stop the recount. It would be too much damage to do a recount. Bush was elected. So the Supreme Court, Bush kind of won five to four over gold. Now they stopped the recount. So there had never been an official recount. Now, there have been a couple of news agencies like AP and a few others have done, their, have done a recount. And most of them said that Gore probably would. Gore didn't fight it. He thought that would be bad for the country. So he came. And so Bush was elected president. And this, this really is going to set the stage then for the rest of the, the history through here. I really thought they might have gotten rid of the Electoral College after this. But actually, this book told us to tell you why that never happened. Bush won and lost the popular vote. So there's an incentive by people who might lose the popular vote to keep the Electoral College. So let's get to what happened almost immediately. Bush is president. There will be a tax cut. He would get signed. He won't use a razor thin majorities in the House and the Senate. He's elected president. Uh, almost went to war with China. All of a sudden, ramping up uh, talk about China and China's becoming a big threat. A U.S. patrol plane in August of 2001 was buzzing China's coastline. Good one of those like this, when we're close and turning back. Chinese fighter went up to intercept it and accidentally rammed the American patrol plane. It landed, but it looked like, almost like out of nowhere, China now is this massive threat. To remind you a little bit of today. But in the background was a series of terrorist attacks in the 90s. In fact, the Clinton administration warned the Bush administration the worst threat is not going to be China or anybody else. It's going to be international terrorism. So you don't need to know these three, but I do want you to know these two on top. 1993 was the first attempt to knock down the World Trade Center by a group associated with Al Qaeda. They try to do the bombs, uh, these bands filled with bombs going to the parking lot garage underneath the World Trade Center. And it blew, or when the bombs blew up, it killed almost 200 people. But that, the building was designed for, for disruption or there, so nothing would happen to the building. It didn't damage a subway station or anything. 
But it showed this World Trade Center was a target. They arrested and convicted the people there. Oklahoma City is another one of these. This is going to be domestic right wing terrorists, anti government terrorists, parked a, a fertilizer bomb outside of the uh, federal building in Oklahoma City, killing over 200 people. That's it right here, including 30 children that were in a, a daycare center in the basement of the, of the, the federal building. One of the worst right wing attacks. Most terrorist attacks today are kind of right wing ultra nationals. But I remember this because almost immediately people started saying there are men running away with turbans after this attack, just to show you how prejudice would take people's eyes. Find memories. I mean, seeks. I mean, it just it's it was so showed you how just immediately people started doing stereotyping and kind of prejudice. But let's get back to other attacks in here. Oh, I should add, there are a lot of terrorist attacks here, and they went down dramatically, but high profile ones. An apartment in Saudi Arabia where US troops were, ha were, were in, were so occupied in Saudi Arabia, and what's what holy cities in Saudi Arabia? That was destroyed, killing over 100 US airmen. The US embassy in in Tanzania and Kenya were hit by Al Qaeda. In fact, the United States responded by bombing their base in Afghanistan. A U.S. destroyer was a suicide bomber hit it, had a speedboat with a bomb and it hit the side of a U.S. destroyer, a U.S. Navy ship in Yemen. Now, those two, I'm, those two, I'm not making you know. I just want to make sure you know these two. But the point is, there's all these terrorist attacks, and the Bush administration basically ignored this, combined with all kinds of of serious uh, intelligent failures will lead to the September 11th, 2001 attack. And this was by Al Qaeda. And we knew Al Qaeda was a threat. In fact, it was that afternoon after the attack that they announced it was Al Qaeda. They knew it was just a monumental series of screw ups. And remember, they're still in Afghanistan, angry at the Americans for abandoning Afghanistan after the Russians left. And these are the reasons they gave. That first one, those U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia. And they knew about the, the misleading the Saudis. I knew about it. Some, some teacher who was in that room when that happened next door. I moved to this one right after that happened. Not because of the December. Because of the December 11th attack, I had to move to the room. Also, these other reasons. The U.S. was supporting dictatorships, especially in Saudi Arabia, I mean, especially in the Middle East. Dictatorships like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Republics, Qatar, Oman, Egypt, indirectly Syria. Also some really nasty ones like in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. And the big reason we support them, they claim, for oil and money. That was part of the reason money, financial center, World Trade Center. It was symbolic. To them, aid for Israel. All that massive aid for Israel, and Israel has occupied territories, annexing them. There are still over a million Palestinian refugees from back from 1948 who don't have a permanent home, and lots of the sanctions on Iraq. So those are the reasons they gave. But they wanted a blow in the United States to show that the United States was this pernicious power that's trying to take over the Middle East and partially they said to destroy Islam. But the big thing is they would do whatever it takes to get the oil and the wealth out of the Middle East. And they thought Israel was like Western or Western colonials. And so the plan was to use hijacked planes and bombs. Now, the thing was, this was not a new thing. they would known about this for a very long time. And in fact, a plan to hijack a, a commercial airliner and fly into the Eiffel Tower was stopped in 1998. So we knew about this. So when there are weird things about these people coming in from out of the country trying to learn how to do crazy things like to take off but not land at various flight schools, it should have brought up red flags, but they were basically ignored. And so they're going to be Four planes hijacked. And after this attack, what did they want the United States to do? Yeah. 
Oh, they want to hijack four planes. I'm sorry. They wanted the U.S. to attack places in the Middle East. They wanted the United States to come in and bomb and invade and create more enemies. And therefore, Al Qaeda could say, see, told you so. Now, this is horrible and psychotic because how many people are going to die? But that's what they wanted. And don't forget, there's no real comparison in motives, but you know, this is an idea of why you do things like this. Remember the Tea Party. They threw the tea overboard because they wanted the British to react with the coercive acts. And then they could turn around and say, see, I told you so. And there'll be other examples of this in history. There's no comparison about the results of this. That's not even the point. The point is, that's what they're thinking. And so they hijacked four planes, two in Boston, one in Newark, one in Dulles. And this is a big, massive, confusing airport. And I've been in Boston airport. And it was the most awful airport I've ever been. Confusing, all messed up. And I remember thinking, I know why they chose Boston. The second worst airport I've ever been in my life was Newark. And you can see why they chose there. Just confusing messes. They hijacked four planes. Two of the hijacked planes hit the World Trade Center. And... It's one of those weird things I will never forget. I was in, I was uh, just getting out of the shower, had NPR on, ready to go to school, and National Public Radio said, we just heard that a private plane hit the World Trade Center, implying it was like somebody's little private Cessna Cub or something. He wanted a little single engine with the planes. And then, no, it was a bigger plane. No, it was a commercial plane. No, something severely wrong. Another plane just hit the I mean, literally, it's kind of like that listening to her. It's like, oh my God. And then I remember my mom called me, my wife's mom called us, and, she, and then I came to school. And it was just a weird, surreal thing. And that's the first power that was hit. That's the second. But by the way they made the World Trade Center, the so most of the, oh, the sides actually stabilize and are the base of the building or actually around the sides, the metal on the sides. It's not in the middle, so open up more floor space in the middle. And they have these big connectors that connect the different, the four sides. But the connectors just have a little bolt. And it was a design flaw. And so when the plane hit, it knocked a bunch of the bolts off. So it destabilized this. This is the tower that came down. Even though it's the second one hit, it was with the low. And actually, if you know where Mr. Solomon's room is, it was about 218 or 219. I remember this. It was right with the bell. And I'm sitting there with a friend of mine who's since retired. Another teacher. We're kind of watching our, our TV around the room. And they came down. Then I walked down to this room. Never forget that. Because once you knew the first one came down, what did you know? And they were saying maybe up to 10,000 people were killed because they didn't know how many people got to work. Fortunately, the World Trade Center, most of the offices or a lot of the offices weren't rented. Most of the people hadn't gotten to work yet, and they were able to get out of the bottom floors. So over 2,500, but it was awful. But I just remember them saying 10,000. And when the towers came down, it was like your worst vision of apocalyptic war. It was unbelievable. This wave just came down and covered the lower half of my neck. It was a shocking thing. And this that was that was almost as scary as the towers being hit. I just because it you didn't realize what happened when these big buildings come down. It also gives you an idea about you know, this is the scene afterwards. Just imagine what nuclear war is. Well, a few minutes later, while we're back in class, the third one hit the Pentagon. It, it appeared like it was on its way to the White House. But the White House is relatively small from the air. And it, it, they, they're going right towards the White House. And it appears like the pilot, who didn't have very much training, you know, kind of goes, oh, White House is really small. Pentagon's the biggest building in the world. Maybe 90 degree turn in the Pentagon. That's what it looked like. It was a decision by the pilot. And then the fourth one was on its way to the Capitol. But by then, 
people, you know, cell phones were using, they were typically using a cell phone after this hijack. And they found out that about the other, about the World Trade Center. And so the passengers rushed the hijackers. And in the struggle, the plane, probably the, the hijackers realized we can't crack, you know, we're not going to be able to hold out. So they crashed it. Just 20 minutes. Almost 3,000 people died. The second bloodiest day in America. Do you remember the bloodiest day? through the Civil War, September 17th, 1862. What? Yeah, Team's still the bloodiest thing. That's the point of Shanksville. And you can imagine the feeling across the United States. Um, just anger and wanting to lash out at whoever did it. You can imagine. And also a combination with fear, especially fear of people outside of it. It just seemed like outside of New York City and these other places. Like, it's going to be attacking in everywhere. I should have, at that time, my, my wife's sister now lives in Berlin, but she was a lobbyist, and she was just in the Capitol that morning, and they evacuated the Capitol, so she was out of the Capitol that morning. So my wife made a lot of panicky calls, and her mom, she obviously fine, but the plane was on the way to the Capitol. So they wanted revenge. And this poll shows that 82% favor going after whoever did it. And quickly they announced it's al-Qaeda. Even though I showed that people in the Bush administration were already saying, can we tie this to Iraq and Saddam Hussein? He said, no, there's nothing there. We'll work on that one. And here's a couple of the famous sites of firefighters. Many of them now are quite ill because of all the dust and everything. They put, they, they rushed into it and that shocking bravery but also incredibly dangerous. And this is going to lead to the global war on terror. Congress basically gave the president a blank check to attack terrorism all over. So sometimes you might see this called this GWAT, global war on terror. And the United States will soon be uh, involved directly or indirectly in fighting in over 160 countries. And this shows the problem of this. How do you find an emotion? Obviously, they're talking about terrorism, but any terrorism? Don't countries do terrorism? Don't our allies do terrorism? Uzbekistan was famous for boiling their political enemies in oil. But we needed them if we we're going to go into Afghanistan. So that seems like pretty much terrorism to me. And so how do you fight this type of war? So by the time President Obama came in in 2009, this shows the global war on terror Seeming like it never ends. I think that's a, I thought that was a pretty clever cartoon. And we're still involved everywhere. And it has dramatically uh, dispersed our forces, made it very difficult on those in the military and other branches. But Afghanistan is where Al Qaeda is. We knew it. We bombed them back in 1998 after Kenya and Nairobi. So they were there. Now, the thing about it was, is that Afghanistan was in the middle of a civil war. Taliban, we already mentioned once before, who harbored al-Qaeda, their allies, and what's called this group of tribal groups in the north, other areas too, but it's just called the Northern Confederacy. So we picked a side. We picked the Northern Confederacy. So we started to bomb Kabul. We sent in special forces, eventually more ground call, um, soldiers to help the Northern Confederacy. And our soldiers, you know, we had no idea who's Northern Confederacy, who's Taliban. We're starting to gather up prisoners. It's really confusing. Here are soldiers from the U.S. 10th um, Infantry Division. It's called the Mountain Division. They're kind of specially trained for combat in, wait for it, mountains. So we joined the Northern Confederacy. And we helped them set up a government after the Taliban fled to ball. You know, they couldn't withstand American air power. We also gave Pakistan a ton of money and Uzbekistan a ton of money so we could fly over and use their countries. We set up a government, but the government's quickly going to be called a puppet government. And corruption is not a strong enough term. They came out of there with hundreds of billions, if not a billion dollars of American money. The last president of Iraq or Afghanistan, when they fled uh, two years ago after the U.S. pulled out, they, they were a year ago, two years ago. 
were literally had pallets, you know, wooden pallets with stacks of hundred dollar bills shrink wrapped on it that he put on his own personal transport plane to take out. And that was money directly given to him by the United States. So just very corrupt. And it kind of a puppet. And now we're stuck in this. And we started capturing people. What do we do with them? How do we know if they're Al Qaeda, Taliban, or just some guy grabbed on the streets of Kabul? So we sent them to Guantanamo Bay. That would be soon dubbed the abbreviation of Gitmo. Remember I told you about Guantanamo Bay in Cuba? And we called them detainees, not prisoners of war. Because prisoners of war, according to the Geneva Accords, which is a treaty we signed, have rights. What do detainees have? It's vague. Guantanamo Bay is not in the United States. Does the Constitution follow the flag? Both insular cases. And that's why they were sent there. And what happened to many of them? And they're going to be tortured. The United States will torture them. And then it turned into a quiet mind. That would go on to 2020. Some British soldiers, they all actually joined in too saying that Afghanistan attacked the United States and NATO allies, like Germany sent a, a regiment and things like that. And it was awful. Quagmire means like you're, it's like, Quagmire is like, oh, you might like put that in your stomach and put it out for a big range. Can't get it. So Quagmire is something you can stuck in the mud and can't get it. So look, I'll be on the Quagmire. We'll have another Quagmire coming up. While this is going on, more fun. Iraq. The Iraq War in 2003. The United States, beginning in 2002, started claiming that Saddam Hussein was rebuilding its weapons of mass destruction program, especially atomic weapons. And we, and in fact, the, the Bush administration said, we know they have them. And also poison gas. And they even used poison gas on their own people. Now, of course, they didn't bother to say that the poison gas they used on their own people for gave. But also, they implied they were supporting Al Qaeda. Now, Saddam Hussein and, and, and Osama bin Laden were mortal enemies. But, you know, let's be honest, most people don't know that. And most people couldn't find Iraq on the map. My guess is a lot of you can, but there's probably a few of you who can. That's not necessarily bad, but what it means is. You have a lot of stuff going on in your life. And so you want to trust the people who told you. In fact, they were saying the Bush administration by that fall of 2002, not only did they have weapons of mass destruction, we know they do. You don't need a smoking gun to find the weapon. We know they have them. You don't want the smoking gun to be in the form of a mushroom cloud, implying they're going to do a terrorist attack on September 11 on the United States. And by the beginning of 2003, almost over 70% of the U.S. population, according to polls, believed that, Al or that Iraq was behind the September 11th attack. They had nothing to do with the September 11th attack. Most of the, terror most of the attackers were actually from what country? Saudi Arabia. So with that, the U.S. abandoned Afghanistan. We kept troops there. But we took out our specially trained troops. We replaced them with um, um, new troops, not as well trained or not as experienced, and started organizing an attack on Iraq. We tried to get allies from around the world. Most countries would not join, but for interesting political reasons, Britain joined. And Iraq's army was, they didn't have an army. They had virtually no army after the first Gulf War. So the first Gulf War, over 550,000 US troops went. This one, we had 150,000. Because we knew they didn't have enough. There's no way. And bin Laden would escape. He would eventually be caught in Pakistan and killed them. But they said that we'd be greeted as liberators. The war actually will, will, will um, make money off the war because we'll sell all the Iraqi oil. We'll make so much money. Um, we'll set up a democracy. Democracy will flourish. And so the plan was just in Kuwait, remember, we liberated them, just a dash to bang. That was literally it, just go. My, my cousin, who's from Nebraska, 
he was a Marine, he was the gunner, so like this guy right here on one of these Humvees. He was the actually the seventh Humvee to enter Iraq during this invasion. It really messed him up, this attack. He went through what happened and things he did really messed him up. Now he's in his 40s, he was like 21. Now, the invasion. The invasion happened, and there's no Iraqi army. And so the few like guerrilla organizations, Iraqi, Iraqis had guns all over. But most of them just kind of filtered off and went home. After a month of combat, of basically a dash into Baghdad, there's US tanks entering Baghdad. There's some destruction in Basra. Iraq fell and a big vacuum took place. There was no government. There we had nothing planned. And so what's going to turn up in there was would be another quagmire. We knew there was a sectarian divide, religious divide. Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims. The majority population were Shia. Saddam Hussein was actually a Sunni. I should have said he escaped and hid. He was captured uh, later on that year. And then the new Iraqi government would execute him. We created on purpose a sectarian government divided by religion, which actually made the religious divide significantly worse. I should add that the government now is, is, is a, a Shia government, very Shia government. And anybody want to know the government of Iraq, Iraq's closest ally? Iraq. It was the exact opposite of what we announced ourselves. And Soon, the civil war would start, start an insurgency, then the civil war. And American casualties were incredibly low in the invasion, but the numbers started. Over 4,000 Americans would die in, in Iraq. We don't know how many hundreds of thousands of Iraqis. The US government says about 100,000. Um, other groups say as many as a million. That number seems too high, but 200,000 seems too low. Well. It was, it was a bloodbath. A third, third of the capital either died or had a It's just awful. And the soldiers who were there went through absolute hell, including here. Um, these are Iraqi. They don't know if they're insurgents or not. How do you know? I mean, they're driving around in old Chrysler. You don't know who the enemy is. That's how insurgencies work. And they were known for roadside bombs. They called improvised explosive devices. You might have heard the term IEDs. And the first American vehicles had no armor in the bottom, and they just devastating. Really effective weapons. It was just awful. And uh, the war would go on. Eventually, in 2007, the United States would kind of end the war with a very effective way. Anybody know how they did it? They just handed out $100 bills to all these, anybody who might be connected to the service. Sacks of $100 bills. Yeah, same deal. Pallets of money, you just gave up. It, I think that would have been cheaper. But now I got to admit, I, I was, um, the population was overwhelmingly, U.S. population was over 80% for this war. And in three years, you couldn't find anybody who was for the war because it was going so bad. I was... I was very opposed, and it was very divisive. So that's one thing about this. I can't help it. My personal bias against this war will come through. While this is going on, there'll be a series of tax cuts. And the tax cuts would be trickle-down tax cuts, a massive tax cut on personal income tax, and also for dividends for stocks. That's your little piece of the profit. These were purely designed for the very wealthy. There are a few tax cuts for, uh, for working people. Here's the cartoon showing middle class with a few dollars and then all the money for the wealthy. And this shows the average annual tax benefit. For the median income, your average annual tax benefit, you got a tax cut of $860. If you're a millionaire, you got a $128,000 tax cut. Remember, this is designed to put money in the hands of the wealthy. Now, the whole idea is they'll build factories. Or do what they did then. Anybody know what they did? Yeah, they bought a lot of those. In fact, you're wait in the big yacht building craze. Oh, Bush would win when when WF now. 
Bush would win re-election. And this would be, this was still kind of in the, it was the terrorism election. And who's soft on terrorism? And they tried to say that the Democrats were. And it's a, it was a nasty election. Elections are getting kind of nastier again. They're really nasty in fact, previous history and it kind of goes in waves. But Bush won the popular vote. He'd be the last Republican to win the popular vote. In fact, only one Republican, he's the only one to win the popular vote since 1992. That's why we saw the electoral college. So there's a very good chance a Republican will win in 2024. I think a very good chance and lose the popular vote by nine or 10 million. Probably even more than 10 million. Yeah, we're talking about whoever wins a popular vote, they'll have their, but they don't have enough states. And the problem is with that one, and I know they're doing that, but it's constitutionality. And with the current Supreme Court, they would probably throw that out. Probably. But I know they're, 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 they've been talking about that for 20 years. And so with that, then Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005. And the Bush, the Bush administration, their, their reaction was embarrassing. They downplayed it. They didn't prepare. Uh, when New Orleans was flooded, when the dikes collapsed, when this Category 5, this is Florida. Look how big this hurricane is. By the way, this was a one out of every 100 year storm back then. Now it's about one every five years. Soon it will be every storm. It's changing. It's, weather has changed that fast. It's kind of mind boggling. But New Orleans flooded and over 2,000 people died. And Bush, along with other things, it's amazing how he won the reelection and his popularity plummeted. He would leave office as one of the most unpopular presidents in history. And partially because of this. Remember that big tax cut? It turned into a big real estate bubble that we call the housing bubble. And housing prices exploded. Here is the annual rate of inflation. Look at the rate of housing prices increase. And people who couldn't afford houses started buying houses. Everyone started speculating, taking on second mortgages, taking off loans, buying houses. By 2007, you have this massive debt bubble. Banks were uh, buying these these bonds credit for mortgage. No, I'm not going to talk to you, tell you about credit or collateralized debt obligations. Unless you really want that, do you? <laughs> In special topics, they know how confusing this is. But it's just created this massive debt bubble. Soon the country was leveraged, which means your amount of debt much more than the size of the U.S. economy. People were just buying, 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 and the whole thing crashed. Beginning 2007, but the big crash was in October 2008. And here is the massive increase in unemployment, a massive recession. They called it the Great Recession, even though it was a depression that went on for six years. And we've never quite got back to the level of growth that was expected in 2008. We are still in the shadow of this horrible recession. And look how many people lost their homes. That's the foreclosure rate. This is going to change politics. This is going to devastate communities. And we saw it a little bit in Montana, but think about the bigger communities. It really affected places like Arizona and places like that. You know, Phoenix or Florida, Hammer, Las Vegas. And we're going to jump right to this. Right here. Now, immediately, the bank that helped cause this would be given a big bail on thing called TARP. Toxic Asset um, Recovery Plan uh, Program, just called TARP. $700 billion of taxpayer money would go to bail out the bank. So here's the safety net for the banks. The Federal Reserve also, on their own, just pumped trillions of dollars, actually money, uh, on a computer screen, to the banks. But uh, don't worry about too big to fail. Write down this. No, but no help ever went to foreclosure. No, all those people 
had to foreclose on their loans and their homes. Billions lost their homes in virtually no help. During the and then during the Obama administration, Obama was promised to promised to help foreclosures, did virtually nothing. Yet they made it very clear that they're gonna um, it's called foam the runways. So make the landing easier for the big banks. Obama was a neoliberal. Speaking of that, Barack Obama, an unknown politician, and could use that to great advantage. He only been elected to the Senate in 2006, so he had no record, or 2004. He announced he's running in 2006. He had no record. What a great advantage, isn't that? You don't have all that baggage. And he was opposed to the Iraq war, as, as opposed to Hillary Clinton he ran against. And so last couple of things. He would win um, defeating the Republican John McCain. Out of this would come a stimulus bill. And you don't need to know the exact amount, just money that would go help to try to end the economy, but it wasn't, this is what we got to get, it wasn't big. It ended the free fall, but didn't get the country out of the recession. That would continue to go down for, or go on for years. Um, one last thing, I know, I know I'm bad. There would be a fight, there'd be two groups. One group was opposed to the government spending, basically the Republican Party, called the Tea Party. And one group that was greatly feared the inequalities of wealth. I'm sorry, I'm jamming this in. And they're called Occupy Wall Street. These would get their start right here. I think that gets us right to the moment. I think we got, that's what it's have to be. Sound good? Yeah. I can and will. This really is the divide today. And Occupy Wall Street had great effect. Uh, the, uh, kind of the emergence of Keynesian economics a little bit. Even through the whole new neoliberal like divide is more, a little bit more. What are we doing next week? What do we say we're doing next week? Trenches. Who asked the crocodiles? something fun. All right, goodbye, everybody. What are people going to bring tomorrow? That's good. Are you going to do this, Mom? No, I'm trying.